But we want to welcome you to our 11.30 Wednesday luncheon Bible study. Hopefully you'll sit at the table, turn the television all that off, and eat lunch while I teach you a little bit about Noah's Ark. Uh, we're in a, current, in, in a study on the last days of the antediluvian period called the days of Noah, uh, and is taken from what Jesus taught in Matthew 24, 37 through 39, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be just like in the days of the Son of Man. And so we're in the son of Man, days of the Son of Man. And so we wanted to go back and do a study on this to see what specifically was going on in the days of Noah that would be prevalent to us in the days of the Son of Man because he compares them. He says, as it was here, it's going to be over here. Well, so we're going to, today we're going to look at Noah uh, and, and what's called Noah and his ark, Noah's ark. And we're going to start with verse 11 and then go through the end of the chapter of 6. That takes us down to verse 22. And I'm going to cover five C words. I'm going to cover five C words. And I'm going to, I'm going to lay this whole study out today based on uh, a homiletical approach uh, to this passage. We're in verses 11 through 13, we're going to deal with uh, the condemnation of the antediluvian world. And then we're going to look at the construction. Then we're going to get into verses 14 through 6, 16. We're going to look at um, the construction of the ark. And then we're going to go on. We're going to look at the cataclysmic flood. The ark is built for a cataclysmic flood that's going to cover the entire world uh, 22 and a half feet above the highest mountain. Then we're going, to, uh, we're going to look at the cargo on the ship, on the boat, or on the ark, as it's called. And then we're going to look who is the captain. Who is the captain of the ark? And so we're going to look at that. We're going to look at condemnation. We're going to look at construction, cataclysm, flood. We're going to look at the cargo, and we're going to look at the captain. So that's how we're going from verse 11, chapter 6 of Genesis, Verse 11, and as we go through each point, we'll read it then until we get to the end of the chapter, and we will have covered Noah's Ark, okay, as well as we can to get a jest, because I'm looking at specific things out of the days of Noah that are important to us over here in the days of the Son of Man. And, of course, the Ark was part of that. The Ark was, of course, a very important part of that carried eight people out of a civilization to a new world, the post-Diluvian world. So here's the Bible. That's what we study. Here's the Bible, spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. Can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Carnality is a, a Pauline term out of 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. You can't live, in, you can't live according to the flesh the carnal, that's Latin, carnal, that's where you get carnality. You can't live in the flesh and please God. Can't live in the flesh and please God. So evidence of carnality, walking, fulfilling the desires of my own flesh, what I want, not what God wants out of me, what I want out of life, not what God wants out of my life, is, is what that point is. The evidence of carnality in the Christian life is personal sin. And it's carnality. I should have walked in the, po in the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, walk, walk by means of the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit, not in the flesh. When you walk in the flesh, you fulfill the desires of your flesh, volitionally, your desires, and it produces personal sin. It could be mental attitude sin, sins of the tongue, or vert sins. So how do I get out of carnality in the Christian life? How do I get out of carnality of personal sin and get back to the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit? 1 John 1, 9 says, I have to confess my sin. That's just one of many passages. It's the one I choose. 
He says, if you confess your sin, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of that sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Now, the word cleansing is really important to the confession of sin because it goes back to verse 7 where he said, it is the blood of Christ that cleanses us from sin. Now, when you come to the cross of Jesus Christ as an unbeliever, it is to remove Adamic sin from your life, Romans 5, 12 through 21. And what you get from God that removes the 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin, like alienation, blind, cursed, condemned, at enmity with God, death, darkness, natural man, perishing sinner, unrighteous, ungodly, and wrath. All of that's on this side. It's not because you're doing it, because you were born in Adam, 1 Corinthians 15, 22. In Adam, all die. In Christ, all are made alive. Those who are dead are made alive, but you have to be in Christ. So when you come to the cross of Christ as an unbeliever, it's for salvation. It's to remove the, that. And the key word is justification. Because the justice of God, when you accept that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, when you, when, when you believe that, the justice of God is, is applied to your life under justification. It is applied to your life, and God removes the 13 judicial charges from your life forever. Now, when you come to the, when you come to the Christian life, you come back to the cross as a Christian it is not for salvation and justification. That's already what is for is sanctification. It's for the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. I'm carnal. How do I get back? I'm in the flesh. How do I get back to in the spirit who dwells inside my body? 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. How do I do that? How do I get to spirituality? 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. I confess my sin. Because it's always the blood of Christ that forgives sin. If I confess my sin, he's faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse. It always works that way. But I come back to the cross as a Christian because I have personal sin and it's shut down my life. I'm still saved. I'm not spiritual. This is a sanctification issue to establishing the importance of holiness in your life. Be holy as God is holy. So that's what this is about. So it could be your carnality could be in, in mental attitude types of sins or sins of the tongue or overt sins. But they have to be confessed and cleansed. When you confess, he cleanses. And he restores you, not, not, not to salvation, but to spirituality. So you need to do that. I mean... You need to be very much aware of how important this is because in John 15, Jesus, in talking about the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit, when he leaves the earth, he's going to send him back and he's going to dwell inside the mortal body of a believer and is going to change his mortal body into the naos of God, a place where the Holy Spirit dwells forever, John 14, 16, 17. This is very important. It's very important to Bible study because the Holy Spirit, if you're spiritual, the Holy Spirit will teach and recall the Word of God in your life. John, the 15th chapter. Very important. Let's pray. This is your moment as a believer priest. That's 1 Peter 2. Every, every believer in the church age under the new covenant is a believer priest. That's part of your identity with Christ. He's a priest. You're a priest. Not like a little, not, not like Levi, not a, not a Levi, but like Christ. Melchizedek and Christ. Come on. So let's have a word of prayer. Father, we come to you, Father, because we want to know your word and we want to know, we want to look at past biblical history. Jesus said, Take a good look at the days of Noah because the days of the Son of Man would be, 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 be similar, be like them. And so we want to do that because we live in the, in the days of the Son of Man and we live in the last days. 
And so that was the days of Noah. The, he, that last 120 years of the antediluvian period was called the last days of the days of Noah. And so I encourage our hearts today, Father, as we look at the ark and how important the ark was and how, how, how would we compare that today? Uh, encourage our hearts, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, <clears throat> we're going to look at, this is actually our seventh lesson in this series on, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. And today we're going to look in chapter 6, we're going to take a look at Noah uh, and his construction of the ark and what it was going to be for and the cargo and all of that that we mentioned in our introduction. Um, it's interesting that the uh, Hebrew word for ark is T-E-B-A-H, teba. And teba, see, when we think of the ark, we think of it as a boat in our way of thinking. And actually, the word in the Hebrew Probably, most biblical his, uh, scholars believe that it comes out of an Egyptian concept and word. But the word tebe uh, means a box or a chest. In fact, this, the reason a lot of people believe it is because of Moses, the book of Genesis and Moses. Moses was placed in a teba. Uh, and uh, floated down the Nile River, and then, you know, the, the rest is they found it, and the, and the daughter of the Pharaoh uh, took him and, and, and took him into her life, and, and, and so he was raised as, a, as an Egyptian. We think that's the background of this word. But it, it's, it doesn't refer to a boat. It refers to a box, which is kind of interesting. It refers to a box uh, and, and, and one that floats. And the box that Noah was put in was built similar. It was built, it was built out of wood, and it was pitched inside and outside so that the water wouldn't leak in. And uh, baby Moses was put in that and floated down the river. And, and God, listen, and God was the captain of that little boat that little box, that little teba. God, God floated that down there, didn't let it get to the other side, kept it over on this side, where uh, the daughter of Pharaoh was bathing with, with her. If, you've probably seen the pictures of it. And there the little box, there he was, and, he, and he, he got caught in some weeds there, right there, right where she was, and they heard him. They heard him, a baby, and... You know, the rest is biblical history. Now, my point is, that's the word that is used with us uh, about the ark. The ark. And what's interesting, when you start looking at verse 11 and go through 22, the word ark is used seven times. That's a lot. The word ark, you can look at it in the English, it is used seven times. Now, in the Greek language... Uh, kaibodas, the word is kaibodas, and it refers the same way. It, that's what Jesus referred to in Matthew 24, 38, and Peter referred to in 1 Peter 3, 20. So today we're going to look at the condemnation, the reason for an ark. We're going to talk about the construction of the ark. We're going to talk about the cataclysmic flood, what the ark is going to have to, what kind of storm it's going to have to weather, we're going to talk about the cargo that was on it, and we're going to talk about the captain and the chief officer of the ark. So we're going to start with the construction uh, or with the con condemnation of the antediluvian world that's given in 11, and 11 through 13. This is last week's lesson. Let me just do recall with you. He said the last days, why he's going to destroy the last days, why he condemned it, is that the last 120 years of the antediluvian period, for sure, that the hearts of the people 
were evil continuously, only evil continuously, the scripture says, which I explained last week means every minute of every day, all they thought was evil. Every minute of every day for 120 years. What resulted was, was a corrupted culture and civilization. And let me tell you, the God of this world, Satan, ran that whole program because it's evil. How do you know evil comes from the devil? Because you write the word devil and mark off the first letter. That's a good way to remember it. Because the devil is evil. And he is the God of this world who pushes evil. And what he tries to do is disguise it as good. First John 5, 18. Now, we're looking at the condemnation in verses 11. So he says, the hearts of men were evil every minute, every day for 120 years. It had corrupted the culture and the civilization. I talked about this last time. And there was violence. There was violence in the home. There was violence in the street. There was it was a culture of violence against humanity, man against man. And for that reason, it produced a, a, a culture, a third race of people called the Nephilims. That from the human side promoted all of that. From the human side, they promoted that for the last 120 years. They ran Satan's system. And he said, enough's enough. And, he bring, and so in verses 11, 12, and 13, we have God saying, I've got a con condemnation is coming. Judgment is coming. Now, there are three things that I'd like you to remember about the condemnation. First of all, they're all W words. Wickedness, a world of ungodliness, and a warning given by God. In the sixth chapter of Genesis, verse 5, every intent of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continuously. I explained that. As a result, in verse 11, we're told that the earth was filled with corruption and violence. In verses 12 and 13 of Genesis 6, we're told that all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth, had corrupted their way. In 2 Peter 2, 5, in describing this, the people of this time period, he writes, God did not spare the ancient world. We call that the antediluvian civilization. God, watch this now, God did not spare the ancient world. Watch this now. But preserved Noah, watch this now, Noah, a preacher of righteousness with seven others, that was Noah's family, three sons and daughter, daughter-in-laws. Noah's wife, three sons and three married sons. Now, what, listen to me. Here's the, here's the antediluvian period. God did not spare the ancient world. Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others. His wife, three sons and daughter-in-laws. When did not spare, but spared, preserved. Isn't that an interesting word? Preserved. How did they preserve them in the ark? When he brought a flood, a cataclysmic flood, upon the world of the ungodly. The world of the ungodly. The ungodly had created a world of the ungodly. 
And how was, they, how was it identified in the, in the people? They're evil, evil in their hearts every minute of every day. It produced a Nephilim third race of people that corrupted the society over the last 120 years. Corrupted it completely. And that and filled it with violence. Isn't that interesting? And so Hebrews eleven seven reminds us, Hebrews eleven seven, the great passage on faith, reminds us how important faith played a role in preserving Noah, his wife, three sons and daughter-in-laws. Hebrews eleven seven, It says, by faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reference, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which the ark, built, constructing the ark, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. You can read about this in more detail in 2 Peter, 3rd chapter, 5 through 7. So Noah starts constructing an ark for the preservation of anybody who would get saved and get on the ark. Only way on the ark was saved. You had to believe that Jesus was going to come one day, die on a cross for your sins, be buried and raised from the dead the third day. If you believed it, there was room on the ark for you. If you didn't believe it, you were left to swimming. So the construction of the ark is given in verses 14 through 16. He says to Noah, make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. You shall make the ark with rooms. You shall cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you shall make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubics. That's biblical cubics. Its breadth, 50 cubics. Height, 30 cubics. You shall make a window for the ark. That's a, ve a ventilation that went across the whole top. And finish it to a cubic from the top and set the door of the ark in the side of it you shall make it with the lower second and third deck and so here's what we have we have three M words the material gopher wood we, we're not quite sure about that because That was the antiluvian world was all destroyed. But I'll tell you what it was. It was the best, best product that and God tells them what to, what, to, what to get and how to build. Gopher wood was the very best for what it was needed to do, and that was to weather the worst tornadic type of hurricane storm ever in the history of mankind. How that was constructed, who knows? But it had to be constructed well, and it took a long time to do it, 120 years. And this pitch, we're a little bit familiar with this because later we have Moses, and they used the same stuff. Now, I don't know about the wood, being gopher wood, but we do know the pitch inside and outside, watertight. I mean, it sounds like a crude ship, in the, and yet it, it had to weather the worst storm ever in the history of mankind. So it had material, and God tells them exactly what the material had to be, how the boat had, what wood it had to be constructed out of, and how it had to be pitched inside and outside, and... and uh, the measurements. Now I put it. I put it in feet, and not in cubics. Four hundred and fifty feet by seventy-five feet, 
by 45 feet. A biblical cubic was 1.5 feet. The estimated capacity of this ark by those dimensions would have been about 35,000 ton. It was made with multiple decks. See all my M words? Multiple decks. It had three decks, each 15 feet, with rooms and the air vent across the top of the ark with one door that closed from the outside, not the inside. I don't, well, Genesis 17, 16, it says the Lord shut the door. The third thing I want to mention is this cataclysmic flood. It wasn't a local flood. It was a universal flood. The Hebrew word for flood is M-A-B-B-U-L, Mabu. That's the word for in Hebrew for it. The word in the Greek is where we get cataclysm from. It's K-A-K-K-L-U-S-M-O-S. K-A-T-A, kata, and klumas, K-L-U-S-M-O-S. That's where you get the English word cataclysm. 2 Peter 2.5 uses that word with that event. It was, this word was only used in the antediluvian world for the ark. This word is only used with that, with the ark. This cataclysm, that ark had to survive a cataclysmic flood. I want to use three W's. The water, the weddings, and the warrant. We're told in the Bible that the water reached 22 and a half feet above the highest mountain. The only thing we know is that the ark rested on Mount Ararat. And the best we understand, it was one of the highest mountains. And after the flood, it was 17,000 feet high. After the flood. That ark had to float 22 and a half feet above the highest mountains. Tells you something about his buoyancy. Yeah, yeah. Genesis 6, 17 and 18. Talks about this cataclysmic flood. Behold, I, even I, am bringing a flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life, from under the heaven, everything that is on the earth shall perish. Jesus says in Matthew 24, 30, 38, For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, they were marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark. Noah preached about the coming judgment and how to be rescued out of it. For 120 years, and nobody but his own family believed him. Thousands upon thousands of people over 120 years heard him. <laughs> in other words, they didn't take anything serious. They were married and given to Mary like they were going to live forever. He kept telling him, you have 120 years. Can you imagine? The only guy keeping a calendar was Noah. He's marking them off because he knows the last day of 120, the flood's going to come. Nobody else is doing it. Nobody else cares about anything he's preaching. And the Bible says, and they did not understand until the day Noah entered the ark and the flood came. They didn't care. Just like many people who hear judgment is coming, they don't pay any attention to it. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. They don't care. Violence in the street, violence in the home, violence everywhere. Nobody cares. It's every day. 
we're getting on with our life. We're, we're marrying and giving a marriage, and life is okay. It's, it's all right. Yeah, we, we just put up with it. My, my, my. My, 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 people. As it was in the days of Noah. But I love what God did in the 16th chapter, in, the, in Genesis 6, 18. I call it warranty. It gives Noah and his family a warranty on, on the boat, a warranty on the ark. He says, I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall enter the ark. A covenant. And God wonderful. See, he would have done it with, with all of these people that are going to drown. He, he was willing to do that with them. And, he, and he, 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 he suffered with them for 120 years that none would perish. And he put a man of God preaching it every day, building the ark. The wonder construction, the wonder construction of the day of the antediluvian civilization. Never been anything like it. This great big box that he stood on and preached every day. People would come every day to see how, what he was building, and he would tell them, and he would tell them judgment was coming, and this was prepared for them. It was, for us, it was just a great big Calvary. Christ is, is, is going to die on the cross and be buried, and he's going to rescue. He, he's, he's come to rescue the perishing like John 3.16. Are you listening to me today? You ought to be, because as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. You ought to be listening to me. Point number four, the cargo. What was on the, what was on the ark? The cargo. What was the cargo that was put on the ark that it was built to carry? Now, it was built to carry a, a lot of people. But a lot of people refused to go. So what was the cargo on the ark that was going to float into the post-Diluvian world, a new world order? In Genesis, the sixth chapter, verse 7 and then 19 through 21 gives a boarding list. In verse 7, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animal to creeping things to birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. Down into verse 19. The ark is ready to sail. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Of the birds after their kind and of the animals after their kind, of every creeping thing on the ground after their kind species, two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. Verse 21, as for you, Take for yourself some of all the food which is edible and gather it to yourself. It shall also be food for you and for them. Noah did according to all that God had commanded him, and so he did. So who do we have? We have saved people. One family, Noah and seven others, we're told. In Hebrews 11, chapter verse 7, when that is described... It is described as Noah's salvation of his household. I'll tell you. God wants you to be evangelical. He wants you to talk to other people about the gospel of Christ so that they will not perish but have eternal life. You want to be rescued so they can be preserved with God forever. But let me tell you who you must not neglect, those in your family. 
your children, your grandchildren, your brothers, your sisters, your mother, your father, your grandfather, your grandmother, your aunts and your uncles. Where are they? They're not on the ark. When listen, isn't that shame? Let's, let's be sure that's true with our families. You have those great get-togethers or, 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 or reunions or whatever it is, be sure you're the one that has the courage to stand up and preach the gospel. That Every person has to go through Christ to get to God, and that's the only way you can be preserved. Only God can preserve you forever. Jesus died for your sins. He was buried and raised from the dead. You've got to believe that personally. Not academically. You've got to believe it personally. You've got to believe it in your heart. It's where you put evil. You've got to believe it in your heart. He says he's going to take certain species, male and female. He wants pairs of the animals. And there's a great story, we'll see it in chapter 7, of their migration to the ark. Imagine that. Nobody else will come to the ark except to criticize and laugh and, and wonder what it's all going to be and everything, even though he's telling them every day. Animals migrate. Listen, they migrated under the directive will of God to the ark and, and to board it. Think about that. Animals. And he gives you a whole category of them. Birds and reptiles and you name it. Had more sense than people. You can read about this in Genesis 7, 14 through 16 and the 8th chapter, verse 17. Not only that, but he had, listen, sacrificial animals. Not just species of animals. Two of a kind, so we, we have them on the other side of the flood, but sacrificial animals, seven kinds of the clean animals. Genesis 7, 2 and 8, 20. Hebrews 8, 9, and 10 remind us that these sacrificial animals were shadow Christology. You need to read Hebrews 8th chapter, 9th chapter, 10th chapter. They, they were shadow Christology. 10th chapter, verse 1, shadow Christology. They were a picture, a visual, a visual picture. He got, listen, he's got clean, he's got, he's got uh, a species of animals, and he's got all these clean animals. They were sacrificed. Nobody was sacrificing them. Except Noah. Noah's the only one that was sacrificing animals on a regular basis for shadow Christology and preaching the word of truth. And people go, like, well, there's a lamb. I haven't paid any to the lamb and the ram and all of these. I haven't paid any attention to them for all these years. Right. Well, uh, they're all bored in the ark. They, they were a visual aid of the gospel of Jesus Christ and what God had offered them in his son so that they could be, be preserved from the judgment upon the antediluvian world. You and I live in the post-diluvian world. This is the world on the other side of the flood. You've got to take the gospel of Jesus Christ serious. That's equivalent to the ark. My, my, my people... What good is it to know the story of Noah and not hear the message of it? The message is, God is not willing that any perish, and you will perish without faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's not that you have academic information. Is it personal? I was crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, it is not I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in this mortal body, I live for Christ. Is that you? That's Galatians 2.20. Where are you in all of this? You better be a good swimmer. And none of them were. 
You can't outswim this type of storm on the sea. My, my, my people. The migration of the animals to the ark must have been a great big visual aid to the unbelievers of the long-suffering God so that none would perish, yet none of them believed. Genesis 6, 20, 1 Peter 3, 20, 2 Peter 3, 9. And finally, the captain. Who was the true captain? And who was the chief officer? Let me tell you. The guy who closed the door and opened the door was the captain. Because it had to be done from the outside, not the inside. The captain was the guy who was going to be able to steer that boat through a storm that nobody had ever, ever seen in their life or ever will see. Let me tell you who's the captain of the ship, who's the captain of the ark is God Almighty. And who was the, who was the chief officer? It was Noah on the inside. God, God running the, the ark and Noah, chief officer, on the inside. Noah was responsible for the inside of the ark and the cargo. God was, was, was responsible to maneuver the ark through a cataclysmic flood and put the ark on its resting place that would be safe. What is important to you and I was the character of the chief officer, Noah, on the inside. And he describes Noah in verse 8 and 9 of chapter 6 of Genesis. Noah found favor or grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. That's why he, if she's officer, responsible for the cargo, what's on the inside. The commission of the ark is discussed in chapter 6, verse 18. He said, I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall enter the ark. This is what he says to Noah. You and your sons and your wife and your son's wife with you. Man, he has a list. And that list has to be comparable with the Lamb's Book of Life. Checklist. The Lamb's Book of Life. The only way your name gets in that is to believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried, and raised from the dead the third day. It's the only way. I don't care what other people tell you. I'm telling you the truth. Look at all the scriptures I'm giving you to try to pull you out of the muck and the mire of life. My, 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 people. Later, you can go to our website and you pull us all down. You say, well, he's going too fast. I know, I just have a certain amount of time for lunch. But I, we give this to you. You got all this material. You can get it. You want to read Genesis 6, 18. You want to read verse 23. You want to eat, read ahead to the 8th chapter, verse 1, 4, 13 through 16, then 21 through 22. That's in the 8th chapter. We're still going through. We're, we're just now finishing up chapter 6. We've done seven lessons out of chapter 6. Then we're going to chapter 7 and chapter 8 and then chapter 9. Before we, we, we're we still trying to figure out, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of Noah. We're looking for specifics. The calendar of the trip is interesting. That's what we'll study next time in chapter 7. The calendar for the trip. Now, they had a, he had a calendar in the construction of the ark and boarding it. 120 years. We got these days, and then there's going to be a day when you enter the ark. Then there's another calendar for the trip. The calendar of the trip inside the ark. 
And do you know what's interesting? What's interesting, in Genesis 7, 4, it tells you on the second month, on the 17th day, in the 600th year of Noah, the flood came. You can't get better, you can't get better calendar information than that. And it gives you this date, when it rested, when the ark, the, it's all dry, and the ark rests on top of this mountain, Arafat. And he gives the hey, second month, 27th day of the 601st year of Noah's life. That's over a year in the ark. Look. And who, who's been in charge of that year? God. Who's been in charge? They've been stuck in that ark with all those animals for over a year. And who's taking care of them? God. Told them, even when they were gathering all the food, they probably thought, well, this is light. I wonder how long it's going to take. Nobody knew. God didn't tell them ahead of time how long it was going to be. But he did tell them how, how much food to get and what kind of food to get. Get all edible food. And, you know, they'd bring enough and go like, well, you, you suppose, God, that's enough? And they go like, no. And they kept bringing food in, bringing food in. They go like, wow, that's a whole lot of food. Well, maybe the animals eat a lot. I don't know. That's a more food than I could eat. Whoever imagined they would be in the, in the ark over a year in a storm. I mean, who's counting? God. God. You know who's counting the days in your life? God. You pay no attention to him, and yet he's counting all the days in your life. All, all, every day. He put a calendar. I mean, you can read this stuff. I'm not making any of this up. The internal security and welfare inside the ark was the responsibility of Noah and his family even before they set sail. And it was to carry them over a year because the grace of God is that powerful. The grace of God can carry you in the most difficult times. The grace of God. Here we are in a pandemic. You're going, well, boy, I'm glad I got a shot. Listen, it's up to God. It's not, it's, it's not the vaccination that's going to do it. It's not the ark that did it. It was God Almighty. I don't know. Maybe I'm talking to somebody. I don't know. I'm talking to myself, maybe. So let me ask a question. How important is it for God to be in charge of directing your daily lives. Whether your life is going through a stormy flood of water or it's resting on dry land, how important is God in your daily life? I mean, who's running your life? I'll tell you something. Bottom line, it's either God or Satan that's pulling the strings on your life. There's no other person. Nobody else has that kind of authority. And I'll tell you where you want to be. You want to be in the arms of God all the time. You want to be in his hands. John 10, 28 through 30. You want to be in his hands all the time. Because that's where safety is. That's where preservation is. 1 Thessalonians 3.11, we've been studying this on Sunday. And may the Lord direct your way. That's my prayer for you, that the, you would let the Lord direct your path. You would let the Lord direct your walk. He tells you to walk by faith. Listen, that means the Lord wants you to walk his way. You walk in the spirit. That means the Lord wants you to walk his way. It's the safe way. It's the only way. Why is this important? Because Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be like 
in the days of the Son of Man. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way to study with us on this Wednesday. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. What can we learn from this? God is the most important person in their life. Must be today, must be forever. Let him, let him direct our steps on the path that he has set our life to travel. And may we be thankful for it every day. May we, we be thankful for it. May we be thankful for the grace of God. The grace of God is always sufficient. It is sufficient every day in every need of every day for our life. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. Thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.